speak a few words, then uh, we have uh, Jin Lu as a uh, executive chairman. So now okay, uh, so you may. Uh, let me start. Uh, right? Okay, no problem. Hi. Hi, Dr. Yao. Yeah, nice to see you. Hello? It's too light for you. So, okay. It's too uh, light for you. It's uh, uh, AM to two o'clock. Uh, yeah, it, it is two o'clock. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No problem. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to Beijing Brain Conference Symposium number 14, Brain Apparatus Communication. So let me introduce our symposium chair, Professor De Zhong Yao first. Uh, Professor Yao is the director of Research Center for Information in Medicine at the University of Electronic Science and Technology of China. He is also the director of Sichuan Institute of Brain Science and Brain Inspired Intelligence. Uh, he is also the vice president of Chinese Society of Biomedic Biomedical Engineering. He has many academic titles, such as Outstanding Youngs of NSFC, a Changjiang Scholar. Uh, he is also the fellow of American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering. He was granted the Roy John Award by Electro Electrocephalogram uh, and the Clinical Neuroscience Society. He's also the Elsevier Chinese highly cited scholar. So let's welcome Professor Yao to give us an opening talk for our symposium. Okay, okay, uh, it's my pleasure. So uh, first I want to thank to the organization, organization committee give us a chance to have this uh, exciting symposium. Uh, brain apparatus communication is a quite new era. There. And uh, I think we have many chance to set up a new mark in uh, scientific domain. I'm very glad to have uh, the uh, following big experts in this area. Uh, actually, I want to, I do not want to say any more. Though. Let's have the time for the for them. So, uh, we, we, uh, and I have Lu Jin as a executive chairman. Uh, that's what I wanted to say. Though. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Yao. Today, we have five speakers in our symposium. Now, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Bharat Biswa. Dr. Biswa is the intellectual father of resting state, functional connectivity with fMRI, and is personally responsible for paradigm shift in imaging neuroscience. His contributions have, have been enormous ranging from a deeper understanding of endogenous brain activity through to important strategic initiatives in neuroinformatics and data sharing. His early work established resting state functional connectivity as a way of probing functional brain architectures. Academically, Dr. Biswas' impact is reflected in the fact that He's an ISI highly cited researcher in neuroscience and behavior. He is also the author of some of the most highly cited papers in clinical imaging. His work has been cited more than 38,000 times with a H index of 70. Several of his papers have been cited more than 1,000 times with one paper receiving more than 9,000 citations. Now, please join me with Dr. Biswas' talk. His topic is White Matter Functional Connectivity, What is in the Noise? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, special thanks to Dr. Yao for the kind introduction. Um, thank you Dr. to Dr. Jing Liu also for the kind introduction. Um, so for the next uh, 30 minutes, I will be talking about functional connectivity as a whole, um, but I will specifically focus on white matter uh, functional connectivity and what we um, will discuss a uh, little about it. 
So here is the outline of my talk. First, I, I will talk about uh, um, resting state functional connectivity and um, its applications in clinical populations um, and how it can be used for other applications also. Um, and then I will talk about white matter functional connectivity and compare it with gray matter. And then we will uh, compare white matter functional connectivity with DTI and um, uh, uh, white matter functional connectivity. I will give some examples in Alzheimer's disease. All right, so the basic idea in fMRI has been to present a stimulus and measure the response. So here is um, no stimulus. The subject is asked to tap their finger. Again, no stimulus. The subject is asked to tap. Um, no stimulus. The subject is asked to tap. And then if it's a finger tapping paradigm, the response looks like this. In the sensory motor cortex, the signal goes up. When subject stops tapping, the signal comes down. And again, in a periodic fashion, um, it goes up and down. There are many, many different ways to analyze these uh, data, and one can make a statistical map, then set the threshold, and then say that, okay, when someone taps their finger, then the sensory motor cortex lights up. The basic idea with resting state was um, like, so we analyze these data at rest. And then when we look at the frequency spectrum, we can see the heart rate and that in the gray matter, the heart rate is greater than white matter. You can see the respiration rate also in the gray matter. It's greater than the white matter. And then there was this uh, slow frequency, which is present, which is shown here. And when we analyze the data in the same way as we analyze the resting state, the task activation data, we obtained a map like this. Again, this is very similar to finger tapping paradigm, excepting this was collected at rest. And um, because Carl Friston had defined functional connectivity as the temporal correlation of task-related neurophysiological signal um, from EEG between two brain regions. Therefore, because we are observing at rest, we defined it at resting state functional connectivity. Um, and this is a study um, which was published in 2010. We asked a number of different groups from many different countries to share the data. So the data was collected from uh, across different race using different scanners, using different field strength, and then analyzed in the same fashion. And we could identify visual cortex, um, sensory motor cortex, the default mode network, and many other um, functionally related regions. So the idea is that while task activation is very useful, in some cases, one could use a single resting state scan and map out many different regions. Again, because we had so many subjects, we could look at differences between male and female, right? We, because we had so many subjects, we could also see differences with age. Like in these cases, these regions, the connectivity went down with age, while in some region, the connectivity went up with age. Right? So while um, task activation study has been very useful in fMRI, you can think of many cases where um, a person cannot do the task 
in clinical population, in infants and, and many other uh, population. So this is showing infant connectivity with, um, you know, one can show the seed-based, the sensory motor cortex, the visual cortex, the default mode. Again, this cannot be done. Uh, you cannot do a task activation study in resting state, in, in infant, right? And this is showing ADHD, adults, children, and children with ADHD. And one can map many different regions using this. This is um, looking at um, tumor, task activation, resting state, and overlap. This is, again, um, study by Shi Jiang Li showing functional connectivity or the reduction in con functional connectivity in subjects with Alzheimer's. This is a um, famous study by Helen Zuo um, showing that you can show differences in Alzheimer's, frontal temporal dementia, and other connectivity patterns in, in different um, uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So while um, we have analyzed resting state data, we had primarily focused on gray matter. And we have focused on gray matter primarily because most of the task study has been done in gray matter. However, the brain has about 50% is gray matter, 50% is white matter. So the question was, you know, while there is vascular differences between gray and matter, gray matter and white matter, could we look at uh, white matter and see any connectivity differences? Um, there was a study done by Zhaoa Ding uh, and John Gore from Vanderbilt, where they showed that along the white matter tracks, both at rest and during task activation, with the amount of task loading, the white matter correlated. Okay. And so um, we wanted to focus white matter connectivity its robustness, reliability, and relationship to gray matter as the largest white matter bundle. How does colossal function from corpus callosum relate to other regions? And then look at neurovascular aging and Alzheimer's disease. So for this one, we use data from the human connectome. And this, the one data we were really interested in is the test retest, test which had 129 subjects, which was scanned two times and had four runs for resting state. This is showing a brief outline. So what we did, again, as we did for gray matter, we took every time series from the white matter correlated um, and then found these connectivity patterns. And so what it shows is connectivity pattern. This is the standard connectivity pattern from gray matter. This is the connectivity pattern using regions from the white matter. Again, this is from 129 subjects from the human connectome project. Um, this was published in Cerebral Cortex. We have made um, every effort to minimize any contribution from gray matter. So this is showing how specific regions of the corpus callosum correlate with the different functional regions. Okay. So, and this shows the reproducibility between um, run one and run two, the two different runs. 
Uh, this is showing it as a matrix form and then showing the correlation between uh, white matter and gray matter. Again, the idea is to look at the reliability between the two data sets. And this is looking at the dynamic connectivity uh, for gray matter, white matter, and gray matter, and white matter. Again, the point is they have sig similar signal characteristics. So from this, what we show is that the gray matter can be obtained by performing k-means clustering. And the dynamic connectivity pattern was obtained in white matter also. Then the question was, uh, for white matter, diffusion tensor imaging has been widely used. So we wanted to look at how does the diffusion tensor imaging tracks correlate with this. And so we use the John Hopkins Atlas, which has uh, use the corpus callosum, which is the largest white matter region into seven distinct region and did the connectivity analysis, right? This is what I had showed you before. And so this is the connectivity pattern from um, the k-means clustering. And in here, what we did was we used diffusion tensor imaging, resting state functional connectivity, and the overlap. Again, the idea here is that because we see this very good overlap between DTI and resting state in the white matter, we think that the resting state from the white matter can show way of information transfer between the different regions and perhaps even between um, white matter and gray matter. So from aim two, the corpus callosum connects different white matter and has unique functional segmentation and spatial distribution. Several previous study and our study have revealed the close relationship between white matter and gray matter functional network. Structural and functional connectivity between the corpus callosum and white matter has been performed independent of each other and a good overall correspondence. Then we did um, graph brain network, which has been used, and looking at the region-wise correlation between white matter. And again, um, in the interest of time, um, just I want to, uh, you to focus that the difference for the different graph theoretical measure, we can see that they, the signal characteristics is different between gray matter and white matter. Again, what it suggests is that they have a different mechanism and not just due to a signal um, loss or so, a signal overlap or so. They seem to have a different signal origin. So the global topologic properties were reliable in the long term and were replicable across different uh, parcellation strategy. White matter connectome has tendency toward randomization compared to gray matter functional connectome and may add a new dimension to investigate. Again, we are working more along this um, area to show a better way. So in the next 10 minutes, I will cover um, an application with all statistics. So, was in the OSIS data set, which had a large number of healthy control, um, EMCI, and MCI as shown. And this is looking at the homotopic functional connectivity 
uh, within white matter for each group. Again, the homotopic is just looking at the mirror uh, location for different regions and then showing where there are differences. And in this case, you can clearly see that between the healthy control, the VMCI and MCI, there are significant differences. In particular, we can see differences in the middle occipital, sublobar, and parietal regions. And this is just showing um, the anatomical characteristics for these regions and showing that there are significant differences between them. And we used a confusion matrix, which is used in machine learning to show that to some extent, we can use these measures to find differences between um, MC using white matter measure to show differences between the three groups, uh, healthy control, VMCI, and MCI. Again, this is just looking at um, hippocampus and showing differences in the dynamic functional collectivity pattern in the Alzheimer's group and showing that there are several different regions which are different um, between um, these connectivity that um, again, this is a preliminary study um, that we can show differences in the hippocampus and that this dynamic function connectivity correlates with the subject's MMSC score. Again, there are, um, I do, and I'm aware that there are other measures like MOCA, which is um, perhaps a better measure, but because we were using a public database, this is what we have. Nonetheless, there seems to be correlation um, with these um, methods. And then looking at path theoretical measures, we can show that different graph theoretical measures like small world associativity, there are differences between the three groups. And again, in this case, we are using white matter region only. And again, the point here is uh, not just that, you know, we can show differences. What we are trying to say is that in addition to gray matter, there's information in white matter, which we can use to show differences between different groups. So um, for, again, uh, for this application, VMCI and MCI subjects showed abnormally decreased white matter um, functional connectivity for bilateral middle occipital and parietal lobe white matter, lower dynamic functional connectivity, the bilateral hippocampus, and um, CR anterior white matter, corpus callosum, FG white matter, and MCI and VMCI, indicating that white matter lesions are an important cause of cognitive decline in AD. So um, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. Um, there is, for example, one can do different physiological measures using um, um, either drugs or anesthesia model, or even in animal models to better study these modulation. Uh, in terms of methodology, a lot of work still needs to be done in combining gray matter and white matter analysis, and perhaps even ask the question, when one performs a task, uh, is there any activation during white, in the white matter that we are not being able to detect? Um, 
Also, better validation needs to be done to show these differences. Again, for clinical application, like gray matter studies, um, I'm hoping that there are many other um, possibility that can be used. Last but not the least, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Yao for his kindness and support. Van Pan, um, who just uh, who recently obtained his PhD, did most of the work um, um, for this study. Um, Shindi um, helped with the dynamic functional connectivity. Um, Rocky Bull with some of the analysis, and Chiang Wen. Um, help with the AD um, analysis. Um, if you have any questions uh, or are interested, please email me at uh, my email address. Um, thank you again um, for giving me this opportunity to speak at the symposium. I wish I could be there in person. Um, thank you. Thank you, Bharat. A very wonderful talk and uh, give us a visual side to the white matter. Usually we think most of them are the white noise, but you give us some very, very productive information about that. So uh, maybe there are some questions from on the platform. And uh, so there is a, an online audience ask you, what about the relationship between functional connectivity and structural connectivity between two white manner regions? Um, again, that's a really good question. And that was the reason for us trying to do DTI of the corpus callosum and doing resting state functional connectivity of the corpus callosum. We are very interested in that, and that is why we did it. Um, but how it, like, can it be extended further? And that is what we are currently trying to do. Um, in, in the first one, what we have done, which was published in NeuroImage, was to look at the connectivity pattern between the corpus callosum using the map which has been established in the DTI and showing a very good correspondence. So that part I feel is um, we have established, but the question I, I think as you asked is what is the relationship between structural and functional connectivity? I feel that's a very important question and more work needs to be done. For corporate co for corpus callosum, I think we have tried to answer it. But in terms of other brain regions, for example, in the gray matter or between gray matter and white matter, what is the relationship? I think I have some ideas we are trying out, but I don't have an answer yet. If anyone has any idea, you can... Uh, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Uh, so there is another question. So in gray matter signal per processing, we usually consider white matter signal as a co covert. So how mm -hmm. to consider the influence of gray matter signal in white matter analysis? Again, these are really good, um, really good questions. Uh, and, um, you know, in, in terms, so um, I can tell you how we analyze the data. So in this case, just to satisfy the reviewer, we wanted to make sure that in the white matter analysis, there was no contribution from the gray matter signal. So we had to remove that. Um, and that is how the analysis was done. Um, so we only used white matter voxels to analyze, do the analysis. But I do um, sort of agree that what would be nice is to take 
all the data in the brain, both white matter and gray matter, do the analysis and then identify, you know, that, okay, these are the regions where there is mostly white matter interaction. These are the regions where there is mostly gray matter re interaction. And these are the regions or these are the ways where gray matter, white matter interaction is. That is, like I would say, that is my long-term goal uh, to solve. Um, I'm, I'm struggling with that. Um, I, so I think I have answered part of your question, but not completely because I myself don't know the exact answer. Thank you, Bharat. And uh, seems uh, there is no more question up to now. So will you, oh, another one is coming. So uh, structural connections in white matter are relatively stable. However, the bold signal in white matter is dynamically fluctuating. So what do we think about the dynamic functional connectivity of the white matter? Do you think it makes sense to study dynamic connectivity in the white matter? What do you think is the best direction for white matter functional connectivity in the future? Um, I, I must say that all the three questions are really excellent question. Um, in, I, I do uh, agree that, you know, with DTI, the measure that we get is very stable, but with um, white matter functional connectivity, um, it is challenging because on a single subject level, these connectivity are um, weak. So, I mean, they're weak, but I would argue that they are robust because these results are from more than a hundred subjects. So um, in, in um, trying to answer your question, I would say that yes, um, you know, like it, it, it's almost like asking which one comes first, the chicken or the egg. And I don't really know, um, is it maybe another way one can frame is, is it the structural connectivity which is driving the functional and the dynamic connectivity or can the functional connectivity ever influence the structural connectivity. I think many of the literature currently suggests that maybe it's the structural connectivity, but I would say that there is a very good correspondence between the two. And perhaps we need to study both to get a better understanding um, for each of these methods. So maybe the time is up for your talk. And uh, another invitation is at the end of our symposium, we'll have a panel discussion. Maybe it's too late for you. So will you join us? <laughs> um, I will try. So it is uh, in New Jersey, it is like now 2.30. So um, I will try to um, join, but if I feel sleepy, then perhaps. <laughs> I, no I mean, problem. I, it's but, totally but I, I will try. Okay, yeah, I'll thank try. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. It's totally absolutely to you. So I know it's very late for you. Yeah. So thank you, Bharat. And uh, you. yeah, maybe you can uh, have a good sleep. <laughs> Bye. Bye. And, uh, and uh, our next speaker is Professor Yi Zhang. Uh, Dr. Yi Zhang is from Shidian University. Uh, he's a distinguished professor of Huashan Scholar at Shidian University, and he's supported by Shanxi Provincial National Science Fund for Distinguished Young Scholars. He's the director of Center for Brain Image at the School of Life Science and Technology at Shidian University, and the primary investigator of Engineering Research Center of Molecular and Neuroimaging, Ministry of Education. His primary research interests are applying neuroimaging to the fields of obesity, 
addiction and acupuncture. He won the Frontiers in Addiction Research Award issued by the National Institutes of Health. His team won a second prize of science, Provincial Science and Technology Progress Award and the second prize of Beijing Natural Science and Technology Award. Now please join me with Professor Zhang's talk. His topic is the mechanism study on gut-brain interaction of bariatric surgery to improve brain cognitive function. Thanks, Dr. Lu. Uh, first, I would like to express my best wishes for complete success of the Beijing Brain Conference and the Brain Apparatus Communication. Um, respect uh, Professor Yao, thanks very much for inviting me to participate in this conference and give me an opportunity to, in to introduce our study. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yi Zhao, and I'm from Xidian University. My topic uh, is the mechanism study on gut-brain action of bariatric surgery to improve brain cognitive function. Uh, I will introduce our study from the following aspects. First is the background. Obesity has become a global health issue, uh, and we are facing an increasingly serious obesity pandemic. Uh, China has overtaken the US as the most obese nation uh, with almost 19, uh, 90 million obese people. The US is close behind with over 87 million. A uh, healthy China 2030 planning outline stated clearly that we should reduce, significantly reduce the growth rate of obese, overweight and obese uh, population. As we know, Obesity not only causes cardiovascular metabolic diseases and cancers, but also have a negative impact on our brain cognitive function. Mm. Um, appetite, uh, appetite regulation involves the inaction of microbiota, a gut brain uh, exercise. Neuroimaging studies show the association between obesity and abnormal function in brain regions and the circuitry associated with hemostasis and the hedonic processes, such as reward, motivation, emotional reactivity, and inhibitor control. Um, alterations in food consumption based on energy um, balance forms the foundation of the hemostatic control of appetite. Hunger and the satiety signal are regulated by change in circulating nutrients. And the oxygenic and erotic gut hormones, the hypothalamus is widely recognized as the gatekeeper for this process. Hypothalamic dysfunction is implicated in pathogenesis of obesity. Um, oops. Uh, frontal. Of mesolimbic regions, including the frontal cortex, striatum, limbic regions, and the thalamus are the main uh, brain regions precise hedonic function. The hemostatic and hedonic systems are primarily participating in the control of appetite and the food intake regulation. There is an extensive cross modulation between them. Imbalance or dysregulation between them would result in eating disorders. Our gut hormones, including ghrelin, insulin, leptin, and GLP-1, affect the hunger and the satire signal and the foot intake regulation through per peripheral circulation and their consequent impact on brain functions. Microbiota and its metabolic diseases are um, metabolites including amino acid, short chain fatty acid, modulate the secretion of peripheral hormones and gut peptides through the vagal and the numerous nervous system that regulate the brain functional activity and the eating behavior. But diversity and abundance of microbiota decreases in obese subjects. Bariatric surgery, including a uh, ruin wide gastric bypass and a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy has emerged as the most effective 
a clinical treatment for morbid obesity, gastric bonding is not used anymore due to the limited weight loss effects and RYGB and SG are widely performed procedure. In RYGB, a small gastric punch is connected to the small intestine by passing the stomach um, here digem and the approximate part of the chitrinum, which is a restrictive and a malabsorption and a reversible procedure. In RSG, the founders of the stomach is vertically resected and the tube-shaped remnant is left along the laser curvature. Epidemiology study reported on JAMA revealed that uh, RIGB and SG could reduce appetite and have a similar long-term weight loss effects and achieves 60% uh, of extra weight loss within five to eight years. However, recent study reported the side effects of RIGB, including the post-surgical alcohol abuse and malabsorption. Thus, more and more uh, surgeons prefer the LSG procedure. We are collaborating with the Xijin Hospital and NIH and focusing on the LSG induced change in microbiota gut brain access. LSG not only decreases the weight and increases the percentage of extra weight loss, but also significantly and specifically reduces the craving for high calorie food. LSG removes the greater curvature of the stomach. As a result, patients decrease the food craving and the eating, which reflects the surgery also change brain cognition. We ask the if the behavior and the brain function changes simultaneously. Thus, we produce, uh, we propose the, that LSG achieves the long-term weight loss through regulating the gut-brain interaction and improves the eating behavior in obese patients. We recruit uh, obese subjects and randomly divided them into two groups. Uh, one group was LSG candidates, and another group without surgery was the control group. Both groups received the behavior measures, a blood testing, fecal collecting, and MRI scans at both before and after surgery. Then we conduct a number of data analysis from the perspective of brain imaging got a peripheral hormone metabolites, got a microbiota, and finally established an LSG-induced correlation model of MGB access. Here is the outline of study. I will introduce uh, them in detail in the following studies. Prior neural images study related to obesity um, prefer to employ the food cure reactivity task and reported a functional abnormality in regions involved with the reward processing. Our previous resting state fMR study also observed similar findings. Thus, we combined a uh, food cure reactivity task with the resting state fMR to explore the neural mechanisms underlying hyperactive reward area in response to stimuli. Results show that the amygdala and the hippocampus exhibit abnormality in both Methods. Resting state activity mediated the relationship between BMI and uh, activation during food cue stimuli. The findings suggest that brain areas of the abnormal baseline activity could be hyperactivity when exposed to food cue. We then I deployed the delay discounting task to examine the inhibitor control function in obese subjects. Results show the hyperactivation in regions of the executive control network and enhanced the functional connectivity between DRPFC and a number of the regions. Impulsivity mediates the relationship between the DRPFC activation and the cognitive control eating behavior. These findings indicate that obese subjects prefer the reward of immediate food intake when exposed to external food, food cue, then the delayed healthy reward brought about through diet management and the physical activity. Last, sensitization to food cue that predict the food reward may override the cognitive 
control and results in dysfunctional reward-based decision-making contributing to impulsive maladaptive uh, behaviors that uh, could lead to overeating. Uh, besides this regional abnormality, obesity is associated with an abnormal resting state of functional connectivity of a frontal mesolimbic circuitry. Obese subjects also in show the increased functional connectivity between ceiling's network and the frontal parietal network driven by artery fun functional connectivity between insula and your singular cortex and angela gyrus. Functional network connectivity analysis show increased functional connectivity between ceiling's network and the emotional regulation network between basal ganglia and the DMN ceiling's network and the executive control network and the decreased functional connectivity between DMN and the FPN and the ECN. LSG has a greater impact on food preference and brain cognitive function, though artery, artery the functional and the structure of uh, several circuitries, we carried out a number of studies to investigate the possible reversing effect of a bariatric surgery on structural alterations in the brain. Surprisingly, improvements in brain matter volume and white matter integrity have been observed just one month after LST, and this structure changes sustained the three, six, and even 12 months after LST. Here we show an uh, increased green matter volume in the coded which region involved with the reward processing, and it's improved the functional and the structural connectivity with the DLPFC. Resting state uh, FMR study shows that LSG increased the brain activity, uh, decreased the brain activity in the hippocampus and orbital frontal cortex, which are regions implicated in reward and the motivational processing. We also compared the differences between LSG and uh, gastric cancer surgery, which is, is a similar procedure in clinical practice. And the results show that the GCS increased the resting uh, state activity of hippocampus, amygdala, and the putamen, suggesting the specificity of LSG in alterating uh, brain functions. Obese subjects show the reduced uh, DRPFC activation when exposed to food cue along with the strength of the connectivity with the ACC, which is important for self-control uh, and executive function at one month after surgery. We further extended the study through combining DTI to assess brain functional connectivity changes and its underlying structure connectivity. Results show um, sustained increase in functional and the structure connectivity of the DRPFC and ACC and the one month and the six month after LSG. And those changes were equivalent to those in normal weight subjects at the six month post the surgery. Reduction in BMI correlated negatively with the increased functional connectivity of the DRPFC and the ACC at the one month and with the increased structure connectivity of the DRPFC, ACC and the one month and the six months after surgery. Reduction in craving for high calorie food cue correlated negatively will increase the functional connectivity of the DRPFC and the ACC at the six months after LSG, suggesting the improved prefrontal functional connectivity contributes to successful weight loss and the reduction in food cue craving, which each has a distinct temporal cause post the surgery. This funding uh, provide evidence that the LSG improved the functional and the structural connectivity in prefrontal regions, which contributes to enhanced cognitive control and sustained weight loss following surgery. In addition, uh, we focusing on investigating the LSG induced change in functional and the structural connectivity between regions involved with the anti reward and the ne negative emotionality and their association with the weight loss at multiple time points following surgery. And the results show that the LSG increased the structure connectivity between the hibernula and the hemostatic hemostatic regions, including the hypothalamus, superior frontal gyrus, amygdala, and the orbital frontal cortex, 
and the habinular hypothalamus structure connectivity correlated with the external and emotional eating, respectively. The findings highlight the importance of reward and the interoceptive regions as well as that of regions mediating negative emotion in the long term of therapeutic. OSG also increased the resting state and functional connectivity between the VMPFC and the DLPFC, between the PCC precuneus and the caudate and the DLPFC, and the decreased the resting state and functional connectivity between VMPFC and the hippocampus. Remorphometry study revealed the latter. OSG increased the caudic sickness in the superior frontal gyrus and the singular cortex and the PCC precuneus, which are regions involved with the self-referential processing. With regards to the clinical demands, we use the, the baseline resting state functional connectivity to predict the surgical, opposed to surgical weight loss. Results show that brain networks related to the ceilings, reward, self-referential, and the cognitive processing are associated with the reduce the BMI and could predict the individual with loss accurately. LSG significantly decreased the ghrelin, leptin, and the insulin levels. And the ghrelin changes are associated with the decrease of the RPFC activation and the hippocampus activity. Structure connectivity between the RPFC and the ACC mediated the relationship between ghrelin and the cognitive control in addition. LSG induced a significant change in short chain fatty acid, amino acid, and other metabolites, particularly change in acetic acid and beta hydroxybutyric associated with weight loss and enhanced eating control. LSG induced the diversity of microbiota and abundance of bacteroids, and there are changes associated with the metabolic level and the brain functional activity. Thus, we established the human correlated model of induced uh, interaction of microbiota, gut, and the brain exercise. As we can see, these uh, three system has a negative or positive correlation with the BMI and also the eating behavior. We are now performing an animal study to test the causal relation of this model. Hope we could publish this human and animal results together soon. In summary, we propose a brain regulatory mechanism model of for LSG induced long term weight loss. LSG reduced the stomach uh, volume by removing the fondus part, thus limiting the intake of food, changing the inaction of MGB exercise, and realizing the rapid reduction of weight in a short period after surgery. As time goes on, the stomach volume will gradually increase. However, they can maintain lower food craving and eating behavior for a longer time. Therefore, we infer that the improved brain cognitive function play an important role in maintaining long-term weight loss after surgery. Finally, it's an ongoing study. Um, LSG induced the brain function and structure changes are closely related to enhanced cognition, uh, improved eating behavior, and decreased uh, weight loss, enlightened us to adopt the non-invasive brain modulation instead of invasive surgery to achieve a cognitive uh, enhancement and a similar weight loss effects. Therefore, we carried out, we carried out the real-time neurofeedback um, to modulate the brain regional activity using functional near infrared spectra. We select the right DLPFC as the target region because LSG significantly less de uh, decreases activation and the middle occipital gyrus as the control region because it has no correlation with the DLPFC. Um, the mean concentration change in oxygen and homoglobin measured over DLPFC was employed as online feed, neurofeedback signal. The feedback was displayed as a series of picture with a certain degree of blur, which reflect the concentration 
of change in oxygenated hemoglobin in the RPFC compared with the baseline. The more blur the foot picture, the higher is the neural activity in DLPFC. Participants were asked to employ a strategy to blur the picture. Participants in the f -Nearest group received 12 sessions of neural feedback training within four weeks, with three to four sessions per week. Each neural feedback training included two training runs, and each run included 12 training blocks, which consists of 30 seconds of resting state and 30 seconds of regulation period. Results show that manure feedback increased the activation of DLPFC and the functional connectivity between DLPFC and the ACC and the coded. Behavior measures show that neural feedback significantly uh, reduced the weight, depressive and anxiety status, improved the eating behavior and the brain cognition. Um, this is a recent group photo of the young faculties and the students of Anama Lab. They are hard working, contributes to these publications. I would also like to thank our collaborators, both domestic and overseas, as well as NISPC. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Zhang. Uh, very interesting work. So a question from me. So uh, just now you mentioned, so uh, 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 how long will uh, this effect last? So it seems the lung effect is still, uh, you are still studying the lung effect of this surgery, right? Oh. Uh for our follow-up study, we, uh, we, we followed uh, one year, but uh, there's a lot of uh, epidemiology study uh, mentioned related to bariatric surgery. And uh, they can see reported uh, uh, the, the post-surgical weight loss can maintain uh, five to eight years with 60% uh, of extra weight loss. But uh, gradually, their weight will increase if they are did not control their eating behavior and the food intake very well, so they will become more obese, like the lowest weight status. So, but uh, you know, for clinical study, we do not have so much energy to perform a longer, even longer follow-up study. It's really tough. Yeah, for sure. So clinical studies, we have so many limitations on that. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So there is a online audience from Bilibili. Uh, is there a clear relationship between the hormonal changes in the body caused by bariatric surgery and the observed cognitive changes in the brain? Yes, exactly. Because uh, 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 I just mentioned that the, the procedure of the bariatric surgery means laparoscopic sleeve uh, gastrectomy. This kind of a procedure is to remove the fundus of the stomach, the, where the ghrelin is produced over there. It produces the, about the 70 to 80% of the ghrelin. That's a kind of a, a hormone that encourages us to eat food. Other uh, gut hormones is to inhibit us to eat food. And so we remove that, so the ghrelin level decreased, and the, the uh, expression in hypothalamus and the uh, uh, hippocampus uh, decreases significantly. And uh, we found uh, the uh, correlation between the reduced ghrelin level and the hippocampus uh, uh, activation, and also the activation uh, between ghrelin and the DLPFC, which is related to the decreased food craving. That's the results, the proof to show the surgery induced the change in ghrelin level and it's uh, consequent impact on our brain and even the eating behavior. But uh, uh, there's a, a bit of way uh, doing a human study. We're not doing animal study. There's a lot of uh, uh, evidence to show in animal models the, the surgery induced the change in the hormone and the uh, correlation with the behavior and also cognitive changes. 
Thank you. Uh, another question is, uh, what is the role of microbiota in the microbiota gut-brain axis? Does it affect the gut first and then affect the brain through the gut? Or does it affect both the gut and the brain simultaneously? Um, yeah, that's a great, great question because it's, it's a challenge for us. Yeah, for, for us, for, in my opinion, I think it should be first to change the gut and, uh, and also the peripheral circulation. And then this kind of uh, changes the level in hormones and they are a peripheral circulation to the, and uh, handle through the BBB and uh, impact our brain function. So the first change should be happened in the gut and then the change the associated the level of a hormone and then impact the normal brain. But uh, uh, in hormone study, we, we can only do the correlational study. So that's why we need, we, we are uh, performing the animal study to test the causal influence if uh, we are cut the stomach and also the the peripheral hormone and also the, uh, the blood factors that impact on our brain. This is, uh, it should be verified in animal studies, right? Okay, thank you. So it seems time is up now and uh, oh. we have to move to the next speaker so we can have more discussions later. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank Professor you. Zhang. And uh, the next speaker, is Professor Yang Song Zhang. Uh, he's from Southwest University of Science and Technology. He's currently an associate professor at the School of Computer Science and Technology, Southwest University of Science and Technology, China. His research interests include brain computer interface, biomedical signal processing, machine learning, and so on. He has published more than 40 papers in refereed conferences and the journals, including neural image, neural networks, and some proceedings in IEEE. Now, please join me with Professor Zhang's talk. His topic is deep learning based EEG signals analysis. Can you hear me? Yes. And you thank you for start. the instruction and the invitation from Brazil. The topic of my talk is the deep learning based EEG signals. I will um, give my talk from these four parts. The first part about the background information. Uh, as we know, the deep learning is a very hot topic in the past decades. Deep learning is kind of representative learning. And it can provide an end-to-end -end learning structures and avoid the handcraft future instructions. And due to the powerful regulation ability and learning ability, the deep learning technology has been adopted in many fields, such as computer variants, and natural language processes, medical image processes, and neuroscience. In the neuroscience, deep learning imaging data modality was, was used to Analyzed by the deep learning methods such as EEG, MEG, and so on. For the applications, the deep learning have been used for the brain signal decoding for the brain computer interface, the brain disease diagnosis, and the brain state detections, and so on. Especially, deep learning methods have been attracted increasing, increasing interest in for PCI communities. There are some insightful review papers. These papers cover a different topic of EEG analysis and applications. So these papers are suitable for the new beginners to start for the research with deep learning for EEG uh, analysis. And for the second part, I want to introduce a simple work uh, for the deep learning for uh, state state visual evaluated potential classifications. As we know, SFC is a theoretical response evoked by a, a frequency stimulus modulated by a fixed frequencies above 4 hertz. It have 
uh, the same fundamental frequency as the stimulus as well as its harmonics. Due to the little um, trainings and higher information and rate, and SOP based design have is received increasing attention. In. A lot of, of, of popular frequency recognition methods have been proposed in the past two decades years. And in recent years, the spatial fading methods can yield the higher accuracy and become the whole topic of SV classification. But for these methods, they need the calibration data to calculate the spatial filters, such as the TRCA. And the, their performance decreased if the calibrated trails are not uh, are in sufficient. As we know, the accurate and enough easy data is time consuming and uh, tiring. So some strategies such as transform learning have been adapted to alleviate this dilemma. Deep learning method that use the subject independent classifying strategies may be also a potential solutions. So based on this consideration, we designed a mixed uh, model with CN and SM modular. In this model, this model, it has been co concludes of four blocks. The first block was a spatial filtering block. It acts like a spatial filtering as the traditional method. The second block was the temporal filter block is used to extract the temporal features. The third block was a, a bilateral SGM block for used to learn the correlations between the spatial and the temporal uh, features. The last block was the uh, full connective block was used to combine the uh, features and conduct the classifications. To ensure the robust performance to regularization technologies were adopted. The first one was spectral normalized. Spectral normalized were used to normalize the parameters meters of the uh, networks. We directly used uh, this technology as the reference. The second one was the label smooth technologies. And for the uh, label smooth technologies, we propose a strategy that use the number of, of the direct labels of each target to calculate the weight scores for all the non-targets. For example, here for the target zero, it have three uh, neighbor, neighborhood. So in the new uh, labels, we could find all the weight scores for the non-targets was 0 0.33. Another example was the target four. We, we can find that it, it's the neighborhood. The number of neighborhood is, was eight. So the weight scores for the non target was 0 0.125. In order to evaluate our method, we adopted two data sets. And the first one was a public assessed data size from and the reference. Another one was collected by our search. It has um, four targets and 10 subjects participated the experiments. Each subject um, participated 20 runs and each run contained four pairs. Each pair lasted four seconds. To evaluate the method, two time window was used, 0 0.5 seconds and one and seconds. And the two classification strategies were used. One was the intra subject, another one the inter subject. In the intra subject experiments, we also use three sites of training data sets to evaluate our method. In the inter subject experiment, the new one subject out strategies were used to calculate the classification occurrence of each subject. And several popular methods was adopted as the baseline. And from the, 
this table we can and see with the one second time window length all method achieve the best performance on the three conditions similar as the 0 0.5 times windows for for the intersubject experiment we can obtain the similar um, classification results as the intersubject experiment we could found our method achieve the best uh, results as the two time win windows but it's worth to mention that the accuracy decreased and drastically in the intersubject experiment so we need uh, uh, further to explore the uh, experiment in the intersubject experiments. In order to ver verify the two recognition techniques, we conduct the ablation, ablation experiments. From these two figures, we can see remove each of the two normalized technologies. They are Results become worse. Then we use both two technologies together. To further explore the possible reasons for the better performance of our proposed method, we visualize the high level features instructed by the models. From the picture, we can see the between class of constraints are larger and the wing within cluster distributions are smaller uh, for the uh, SVP net than other methods. So we can get a better um, classification results. And conclusion, uh, in this um, part, we proposed a, a mixed uh, model to, with the two uh, normalization technologies for the SVP classifications. The extensive experiment just train that as our models can be a promising candidate to uh, for the SVP frequency recognitions. Besides, the spectral normalized and uh, label smooth technology could be a potential strategy to design the deep learning models in the future. The second part was the deep learning for the multi emergent classifications. I will introduce a model that proposed for two class, two class classification tasks. As we know, motor imagery um, can be seen as a mental rehearsal of uh, um, motor actions without any overt motor output. Motor imagery has become a very important branch to design the B side systems. But Occurrence decoding the user's uh, intentions uh, still a challenging problem. There are the two different uh, um, ways to design the uh, decoding methods. One was the traditional methods that uh, uh, we need a future structures plus uh, classifiers. This well known uh, future structure for the motor imaging was the component spatial patterns. Another way to decoding the motor imaging was the deep learning method. Here now, uh, some sort of method has been proposed, such as DeepNet, ShareNet, and EGNet. How to design the um, deep learning models? Uh, different researchers may um, focus on different uh, principles. Therefore, there are many models have been proposed for motor imaging decodings. In this study, we wanted to design the model based on the neural mechanisms of the motor imagery. As we can see from the figure. During the left hand and the right hand mental imagery, we can find 
the differential um, spatial patterns on the sky. So this may be a, a good angle to design our deep learning models. So based on, on this phenomena, we designed a, a dual, dual branch and parallel hamstring decrease path networks, which we explore, uh, obviously explore the, the spatial topological information during the motor imagery. imagery. And this model includes three parts. The first part was the temporal modules. It was used of uh, uh, temporal convolutions to extract the temporal dynamics in the EG signals as other uh, deep learning method. The corner part was the uh, second uh, module by hemisphere spatial discrepancy module. We used two parallel branches to explore the spatial topological information during the left and the right hand in motor imagery. And the third part was the um, classifier. We first conduct a square and um, operations to the output from the signal um, module and then use the logarithm and, and uh, every four layer to further conduct on the uh, features. In order to evaluate our method, we use a public, public assessed data set from Korean University. It have 54 health, um, health subjects. And for each subject, it have 400 chairs from two sessions on deep, on deep learning days. Before we input the data into the deep learning models, and some processing and operation was conducted, such as um, band pass filter and uh, um, data, data segment. In order to evaluate the, the performance, we use the new one subject out strategies. And we, during the training model, we use the negative log likelihood loss functions. For the redundancy, we can see from the tables, our proposed models achieve the best results. And is the, the number of parameters is smaller than the deep net. Even with the uh, compact the volume of our method, it can achieve the accuracy above 80%. To further evaluate the performance of different methods, we calculate the classification accuracy with different number of um, channels. We can see under different conditions, all method uh, still yield the best uh, results. And uh, the number of the parameters of our model was uh, smaller than other methods. For the deep learning, deep learning method, the amount of the training data can influence the performance. Therefore, we use different sites or training data to further verify the performance of the top three methods, as we can see, although decreasing the uh, amount of the training data, the performance of all the methods uh, decreased, but our method still yielded the best results than other methods. The interpretability uh, is an important ind indicator for the effectiveness of our deep learning models. So we wish line the kernel width in the second module as the topographic plot. We can see from the figure, most of the uh, corners can have learned the differential information on motor related regions and uh, other regions such as temporal, temporal and uh, hospital regions also 
can be found. And these regions have been reported in previous or research researches. So these findings further verify the uh, effectiveness of our models. For this part, we built a, a model dehydrated for subject independent classifications by incorporated the hemisphere as a metric and neural mechanisms into the design of neural network models. And the proposed model yields um, satisfactory accuracy of above an 80%. But we also find that the deep learning models depend on the number of electronicals. And from this study, we want to see in the future, we need to design the deep learning model from the perspective of neural mechanism of different and desired tasks. And the last one was a preliminary a work we conducted on differential recognitions. As we know, major depression disorder is a common mental disease. And the traditional diagnosis method based on the uh, subject assignment, assignment measures, which may lead to misdiagnosis. So, occurrence the um, diagnosis method are are needed for the depression detections because the each data have higher temporary resolutions, non-investigative and easy setup. It can be used a powerful tools for the depression diagnosis. There's also two kinds of methods that can be used to and conduct the diagnosis for depression detections. For the transition methods, we need hand, handcrafted features such as a super powerful to um, extract the discriminating information from the EEG signals. And we need an extra classifier to conduct the final classifications on the uh, data. But for deep learning, it's a end to end and fashionable. So in recent years, the deep learning have received increased attention for the differential detections. As I said before, during designing the deep learning models, different research may focus on different principles. Here was still resorted to the neural mechanism of dep depressions. We can see from the figure, several studies have pro provided that uh, MDD patients have learned spatial and topographic patterns com compared to their health controls. Despite by this, we design an, a simple end-to-end uh, end deep learning models to learn the spatial topological difference between the and depression patients and the health controls for um, detections. This is the model we proposed. It's a very compact model. It's only contains two convolution layers. The first layer convolution we used to uh, extract the uh, temporal uh, features from the EG. The kernel Component for this model was the second convolution. We use a large scale of convolutions along the time domain to learn the uh, activity in each electronicals. Then from the third, the fourth um, part, we can see we can get a, a future max the size equal to the uh, number of the electronicals. 
So this can be a, a serve as serve as the um, topological maps for the EG signals. In order to evaluate our method, we use two deep learning models as the baseline. So the first one was the EGNet, which was a, a sort of a method for EG processing. Another one is a, a model designed for the depression detections. A public data sets were used to um, evaluate our models. It has um, 30 MDD patients and 28 health controls. And each subject has uh, five minutes resting state signals. And before the input into the uh, easy model, uh, the deep learning model, and uh, some basic uh, processing that was conducted, such as uh, bandpass filter and uh, average refer ref reference and uh, they score normalization. And five seconds time windows were used to uh, conduct the classifications. And more details can be found uh, from this uh, reference. From this, this table, we can see our uh, compact models achieve the best uh, um, accuracy so compared to other uh, sort of method. In this table, we use the leave one subject out strategy, strategies to uh, evaluate the um, performance of all the models. We also conduct the uh, classification of five subbands. We can see for our for our method, we can choose the best uh, classifications in delta band, sage band, and uh, gamma band, which is con consists to the uh, neuroscience uh, findings that the uh, depression is related to this subband. And to verify, verify the ideas behind the proposed most medicine, we um, visualize the futures learned by the by the uh, deep learning models proposed by us. We can see from the figure two, the model learned the different uh, term spatial topological patterns between the uh, MDD patients and the health control uh, subjects. This further uh, pro proved that our medicine have captured the spatial difference information. Conclusions. And we con conduct a preliminary work on, on the different classifications uh, by use the spatial topological difference between the MDD patients and the health controls. We also investigate the classification ability of five subbands. In the future, we need to uh, further validate the effectiveness of the proposed um, models on other mental dis disorder datasets. And summary, uh, summary for uh, this talk, we proposed the three uh, deep learning models for uh, three kind of EEG data, respectively. Uh, as, as we can see from the three works, and end-to-end -end deep learning models can be uh, uh, efficient uh, tutors for EEG data analysis. Besides, designing the deep learning models from the perspective of neural me mechanism could be uh, important angles for different design tasks based on EEG data. Interpretability analysis should be enhancement in the deep learning networks. Instead, I wanted to 
acknowledgement of my collaborators and my students and the funding from NSFC. And thank you for your attention. In the end, I wanted to announce of advancement to call for papers. We launched a special issue in the promotion and journal of foreign apparatus communications. We welcome you to contribute to this issue and the detailed information could be found in the website. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. And uh, there are some questions from online audience. So question number one, uh, it seems like SSVPNet could be a good candidate for SSVP-based BCI systems. But I have a couple of questions. Uh, first, the most interesting component of SSVEPNet is the attention-based label smooth technology. I wonder whether this technology would benefit other deep learning models. Second, SSVEPNet was only validated on two small category datasets. Would it work on large datasets such as benchmark 40 class dataset? Uh, good questions. Uh, for the first one, um, in fact, we have conducted an experiment uh, to use the uh, label smooth technology on other uh, deep learning mo models. We could found that for most of the uh, deep learning models, the label smooth technology can enhance the uh, classification results. For the second one, um, although we have uh, conducted our uh, experiment uh, on two small scale data sets uh, in, the, uh, in the paper, but uh, we have conducted the uh, classifications and the experiment on uh, benchmark data sets with 40 uh, targets, and we can achieve comparable results um, with the uh, well-known uh, methods like uh, TRC, and thank you. Uh, question number two, for the DHD net, it can be used for multiple classification in the motor imaginary paradigm. Is that right? Uh, a good question. Uh, in fact, uh, we designed the DHD net um, based on the two classes of classifications, uh, left hand and uh, right hand uh, motor imaginary. So if we directly use this model to uh, match classes uh, of motor imageries, and we may need to uh, redesign the, uh, corner, uh, the core component in, in the second part, because for multiple class of motor imageries, the pattern may be not asymmetric, such as if we imagine the uh, uh, foot, uh, uh, foot, and the uh, related uh, brain region maybe on the middle of the scalp. So we, if you use, still use the same strategies to uh, conduct the multiple, multiple classifications, um, the performance may be uh, um, the best. But we have conducted the uh, experiments on the BCI computer competitions and data sets, we, we can um, um, get the um, comparable uh, results uh, with other um, um, sort of methods. Thank you. Um, it seems uh, your talk is, <laughs> many people are paying attention to your talk and more questions. So uh, I think uh, the last question for this session, so question number three, due to the size of sample data, deep learning models will be overfitted in cognitive neuroscience. In practical application, how can we avoid overfitting and archive more robust experimental effects? And for the, uh, as I, I have um, I said in my talk, uh, we, we have uh, um, checked the, uh, and, um, number or amount of uh, data sets, uh, training data sets to the 
uh, classification result of the deep learning models. And in and for our model, the the number of parameters uh, about uh, um, um, 60 and yes, 60 and billions and billions is very large. So we use a two uh, and regularization technology technologies in the models to avoid the uh, wall fittings. But uh, um, these two uh, um, regularization technology may be not enough for the very big uh, deep learning models. We may need a, a further uh, um, strategies like uh, we, we can use the um, 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 deep learning model to generate the artificial data to extend the training data sets. Thank you. Okay, so there is one more question from the platform, but due to the time limit, so we can leave it to the panel discussion later. So thank you, thank you, Professor Zhang. And uh, let's move to the next, maybe the last uh, talk for our symposium today. So it's my talk. And uh, okay, so let me share my screen. And... Okay, so uh, before my talk, so I need to introduce myself. <laughs> uh, I'm now an associate professor of biomedical engineering at School of Life Science and Technology at University of Electronic Science and Technology of China. And uh, my research interest is now about the brain and music, uh, especially using neural information methods uh, many include brainwave music technology, the plasticity of music to the brain, and the neural modulation of music on emotion and aging. So, okay, so now uh, this is my talk. So, hello, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to share my recent work in this symposium. So, my topic is uh, study on the brain mechanism of music intervention in cognitive aging. So, uh, as you know, the rate of population includes aging in the world is accelerated rapidly in recent years. Among the normal aging, brain aging is the most key factor we should pay attention to. As this paper showing uh, in e life, the influencing factor of brain aging includes the early life, uh, just like the maternal smoking, birth weight, uh, and also the lifestyle. Uh, uh, did you do exercise every day? What did you eat every day? And the third fact is a body measurement. So are you fat or not? Uh, how about your bone density and your blood analysis and so on? And the last should be a cognitive test scores and health outcomes, of course, including the mental health. Age-related memory impairment is a natural process of aging. Uh, it occurs in many animals and also the humans and tends to get worse after the age of uh, 60. Uh, the normal aging process is associated with declines in certain cognitive abilities, such as processing speed, a certain memory, language, uh, visual spatial ability, and also executive function ability. Cognitive declines such as memory loss is even worse in Alzheimer disease patients. Age-related neurological and psychiatric diseases such as uh, Alzheimer disease, vascular dementia, Lewy body disease, frontal temporal lobar degeneration, Parkinson's disease, uh, hippocampal sclerosis, and so on. Uh, they are greatly impair the health of elderly and bring a heavy burden to the society and also the families. According to this report from American Alzheimer's Association, among the diseases related to brain aging, Alzheimer's disease has the highest proportion, uh, reaching more than 60%. So it's very, uh, very uh, serious problem. 
this is a picture showing changes in the structures of uh, frontal regions, especially the prefrontal cortex with age lead to decline in various cognitive functions. From the figures on the right, we can see that the age has an impact on areas such as the prefrontal cortex and the cortex and has the greatest impact on the volume of green matter in the prefrontal cortex and further affects cognitive functions such as inhibitory control, working memory, and so on. How could we fight against the agent, especially the pathological agent, just like Alzheimer disease, dementia? At first, we would say the drug. However, up to now, the failure rate of the drug intervention is above 99%. Most of these drugs are supportive rather than disease modifying. They did nothing, uh, nothing basic to, to the disease, and they do not appear to change the end result of the disease. So let's think about another way, just like the non-drug way, especially in the early stage of AD, just like the preclinical AD stage. We can have the recreational activities just like the sudoku, uh, reading, crafting, exercise, doing more social activities. We could do something about uh, nutrition. Uh, some studies have shown uh, eating blueberries every day will improve memory loss and also have some vitamins just like vitamin B6 and B12. And uh, some studies have proved that the, these vitamins may lead to memory problems. And the third, maybe we can have adequate sleep and rest. And some functions uh, could be improved during sleep. And at last, uh, we can also do the music therapy. And, uh, but the music therapy, we can have the receive music therapy and also the active music therapy and uh, both received and also the active music therapy, we can find uh, this, these two kinds of music intervention is a feasible, low cost and accessible intervention, especially for those in the early stage of cognitive de decline. Recent 10 years, there are more studies on how music affects aging. This study show music training can improve cognitive functions such as speech perception and auditory working memory, uh, especially in the condition of speech noise. Besides normal aging intervention, there are also some clinical studies on Alzheimer's disease, just like this study. It shows the effect of music therapy on behavioral and psychiatric symptoms of dementia. A six-week music therapy study finds a significant improvement in memory, anxiety, mild to moderate cases. It suggests that a music therapy may have a positive effect on some cognitive functions. Uh, and among these uh, diseases, especially the Alzheimer diseases patients, the different degrees of disease uh, this study have proved that the music therapy all have the positive effects. Uh, this study used uh, MSES, MPI, uh, which are many mental state examination, neuropsychiatric inventory. Uh, they, these tests were proved that uh, we can see under both mild and the moderate uh, state of Alzheimer's disease, uh, music therapy has a positive effect on many cognitive aspects, such as attention, language, memory, and so on. So up to now, we can see behavioral tests have confirmed that the effect of music interventions, uh, but the brain mechanism should, should be further studied. And the second is which brain region should we pay attention to? Of course, the prefrontal regions I mentioned just now. So when we research the literatures about brain aging, we can see many studies like the figures shown here 
uh, including the Alzheimer disease with increased, uh, increasing age will make the prefrontal cortex a wide manner and gray manner model entropy. This kind of entropy includes total volume, white matter volume, green matter volume. This is a structural evidence for the intervention of the brain agent. Let's see some task evidence. Here is a longitudinal study lasting six years. At the beginning, the study recruits 60 subjects performing a semantic classification, uh, classifica uh, classification task using fMRI to scan the brain. So after six years, yes, they do the same task. And they find that older adults have a wider range of activation in frontal lobe, and including the PFC uh, in the pretest after six years. Uh, this suggests that for the same task, older adults require additional activation to maintain performance on the task as age. Let's go back to the music intervention. Music training includes a variety of approaches, such as listening to music, playing instruments, singing, and also dancing. The relationship between the prefrontal and sixth sensory cortex is very important. Here are some issues we concern. The first is what's the relationship between the prefrontal and the sensory cortex during aging? The second will be, Studies on the mechanism and the sustainability of music interventions on cognitive functions. Here we take the inhibitory control as an example. The first study is exploring the relationship between prefrontal and sensory areas during normal aging. Here are some hypotheses uh, we search in the current literatures about the relationship between the perception and the cognitive decline in older adults. So hypothesis for the association between the perception and the cognitive decline in the elder includes these four main uh, hypotheses. Uh, the first one, let's talk about the cognitive load and perception first. Uh, it says poor cognitive ability leads to poor perception performance. And another hypothesis is the information degradation hypothesis. It says lack of perception input will affect the performance of cognitive tasks. And another one is the sensory de deprivation hypothesis. It says lack of sensory input leads to cognitive decline over time. Finally, an important theory of cognitive aging that we call the common cause hypothesis was proposed in 1994, which posits that a common neurobiological mechanism is is responsible for the age-related decline in sensory processing across regions. The common cause hypothesis initially focused on the cognitive and the sensory domains, focused on vision and pure tongue hearing. As shown on the right, healthy aging has a joint effect on visual and auditory perception and cognition. Subsequent studies have expanded the theory to include other cognitive and motor functions that decline with age, all of which are moderately or significantly correlated with age. This is a paradigm we use. The visual stimulus was a black and white square a checkboard pattern presented for 50 milliseconds in duration. Uh, uh, auditory stimulus was a uh, monoral harmonic complex tone, it also lasts uh, only 50 milliseconds in duration. And uh, the tone was presented on, to the left or right ear through insert earphones. And uh, the last, uh, we have the tactile modulation. Uh, during the somatosensory stimulation, the valves were activated to periodically inflate the membrane and deliver brief pressure pulse of 50 milliseconds during the fingertips. Of course, we record the EEG during the whole experiment. Let's see the result. First, we can see the ERP result. Uh, we have the AEP auditory evoke potential, visual evoke potential, somatosensory evoke potential. In auditory evoke potential, in older adults, we can see the N1 and B2 waves 
and perceived an early positive defection with a group mean peak latency of around 60, about 50 to 60 milliseconds after the sun onset. In racial evoke potential in both young and old adults, uh, VEP were characterized by P1, N1, and also P2 deflections that peaked around, uh, around the 85, 150, and 230 milliseconds, uh, respectively, over optic, uh, occipital and parietal occipital areas. And uh, in somatosensory evoked potential in both groups, uh, SEP comprised a positive deflection peaking at 90 milliseconds after uh, stimulus onset at central parietal and parietal uh, sites over the hemisphere contralateral to the uh, stimulated hand. Increased uh, neural activity in one sensory brain region in older animals is followed by a similar trend of increased neural activity in other two sensory brain regions. We can conclude from this ERP result. And uh, we can later we can see uh, this picture on the left uh, of this slide. The scalp recorded both potential reflectors. Uh, neural responses generated in distributed coding sources. And uh, uh, to determine uh, which the age-related uh, increase in early sensory evoked potential reflex increased the uh, excitability in sensory cortexes, we use the distributed source modeling, just like Clara, in the Bayesian software to localize generators of scalp recording evoked potential for each sensory modality and each time point per participant. Then we compare the source strength and each time point from stimulus onset to 300 milliseconds after stimulus using cluster-based permutation test of distributed source space data. Uh, just as shown in this figure in the auditory modality, the between group contrast the yield greater source activity in bilateral auditory cortex along the superior temporal gyrus according to interval that encompass the P1 and P2 defections. And the young adults showed stronger source activity in the mild parietal region. Compare with the young adults, let's see the visual cortex, the VEP, as the older adults showed enhanced source activity between 80 and 130 milliseconds after stimulus. And uh, for the somatosensory modality, uh, the older adults also showed enhanced source activity in adults showed greater uh, in somatosensory cortex between one, uh, maybe around 120 to 140 milliseconds after stimulus. Additionally, older adults showed greater source activity than young adults in the right parietal and the right inferior and the right inferior uh, frontal areas. So on the right of the slide, we uh, use the PLV, a kind of me uh, measurement of connectivity uh, uh, to be more uh, specific, a measurement uh, of phrase uh, synchrony between two different time series uh, to examine the synchronization in auxiliary activity between brain sources. Uh, this uh, result show the synchronization of neural activity between the prefrontal and the sensory cortex, including the auditory and the visual uh, part. Uh, they have the, some connectivity uh, suggesting the importance of prefrontal cortex in regulating sensory processing. Later, we conduct a correlation analysis to test the premise that age-related changes observed in one sensory modality would be related to changes in uh, other sensory modalities. So uh, older adults who showed enhanced source activities in bilateral auditory cortex also showed enhanced source activities in visual and somatosensory cortex. So we can see in older adults, the strength of auditory source activity was positively correlated with POV 
such that higher synchrony was associated with stronger source activity. So let's do a brief summary of this study. So our study revealed robust age-related changes in three sensory domains across a range of neural metrics. Importantly, older adults who showed increased neural activity within one sensory domain also showed enhanced neural activity in the other two sensory modalities, but we cannot see the difference in young adults. The second is age-related increases in neural activity in sensory cortex coincided with enhanced neural synchrony between the prefrontal cortex and the sensory cortex, underlying the importance of prefrontal in regulating sensory processing. This finding support the common cause hypothesis I mentioned before, that the aging and highlight the role of prefrontal regions in expert in top-down control over sensory cortex. Let's go back to uh, the slide, just I mentioned to you, uh, changes in the structure in frontal regions, just like the prefrontal cortex, which age lead to decline in various cognitive functions. And the inhibitory control, we can see from the literature, the important ability in aging. Uh, what are the mechanisms behind them? How about the sustainability of the mutant intervention? So here is our next study. We take the inhibitory control as an example to see the mechanism and sustainability of the music interventions on cognitive functions. 16 healthy sub uh, participants, we choose 16 healthy subjects uh, in the music group. Their age range is about 57 to 80 years and uh, 17 in the visual art group. And the visual art group, uh, they are doing painting and something uh some forms of art creation and another 17 in the control group and the participants had limited music and visual art training and uh, we have four stages in this study and uh, uh, during the we have the four stage in this study and uh, uh, we record uh, the EEG and uh, do many psychometric tests uh, uh, in the pre-training, post-training, and the follow-up test. And we uh, conduct a go-no-go -no -go task. Uh, so uh, I don't want to go to many details about the go-no-go -no -go task. And uh, then uh, we, uh, we can see some of the results uh, for this study. And this is briefly all three, uh, all three groups uh, showed uh, the performance on go trials. And uh, there was no difference between the groups, no between the pre and post test sessions. The group by session interaction was not significant for a currency or response time measures. And uh, we first compared the oscillation brain activity elicited by the go and no go trials among all subjects. Cluster-based permutation statistic revealed greater theta power for go, no-go versus go trials over middle, central, and frontal regions. Compared to the go trials, no-go trials were also associated with enhanced beta power, but beta power is not significant different. The enhanced beta, theta and beta power during the go no go trial is consistent with prior studies in on and out, just like reflects the engagement of executive control mechanisms that withhold response exec execution. And in order to better understand uh, the effect of music training on the go no go modulation, we compared the mean theta power for the go and the no go trials between the pre and post training session. And we can find uh, the main effect of session on beta power was not significant, but the theta power is very significant different. So we can see three months of music training reduced the difference in theta power between go and no go trials. Then uh, we are concerning how long could the training effect last? And a subset of participants from the music and also the visual and the training group took part in a three-month follow-up test. 
during these three months, they do nothing. So we can see after three months, how about the music training effect? How about the visual art training effect? And we can see uh, during this, this uh, during, after the three months follow, follow up, the music training effect is short. Older adults may need ongoing training, just like the periodic doses to maintain the long-term benefits of music training. Also, we tested uh, whether the impact of music training on theta power indexing response sub suppression was linked to changes in the functional connectivity with attentional work network. So we also do the POV connectivity uh, analyze and uh, we can see uh, this pattern, uh, especially uh, the follow-up uh, condition, the pattern is very close as before the test. Again, we can see uh, the short-lived, uh, the music training effect is short-lived and disappeared by, almost disappeared by the follow-up test. And uh, uh, we can also see after training, the functional connectivity between the prefrontal visual and auditory regions are uh, associated with each other. So we can see the prefrontal and the sensory cortex are very important for the music training on aging. So let me do the brief summary for this study. This study has shown that the theta oscillation play an essential role in the go-no-go -no -go task, especially during no-go trials. During response inhibition, uh, phase synchronization in the theta band is enhanced in frontal central regions. Uh, theta oscillation are essential for inhibitory control functions and their activity is associated with inhibitory in responses. And we can see the music training reduced the difference in theta oscillation between no-go and go trials, while visual arts training remained unchanged. Thus, this is an indicator of the brain mechanism by which the music training in turn intervenes in heavy control and therefore has a better intervention effect in older adults. And also the POV uh, results and also the follow-up uh, results show the prefrontal and the sensory area is the key factor for the music training on aging and uh, for the follow-up thing. And uh, we mentioned it almost disappeared the training effect. And here is the conclusion of my talk. The first is age-related increased in neural activity in the sensory cortex are associated with the neural activity between the prefrontal and the sensory cortex. Also, our study demonstrated age-related difference in POV between prefrontal regions and the sensory cortex, suggesting the age-related changes in prefrontal and sensory function may account for deficits in cognitive function in healthy older adults. And the second point is take the inhibitory control, for example, we found that the theta power indexing response sup suppression was significantly reduced after music training, which associated with reduced functional connectivity between prefrontal visual and auditory regions. But the follow-up test suggests that uh, this kind of effect uh, cannot last long. So here are some take home message. So uh, the first is how about the relationship between the prefrontal and the sensory cortex under training, just like the painting, dancing, and we need to confirm later. And the second is considering exploring the other functions in agent, such as working memory. Here we only uh, test the inhibitory control function. The third one is explore which age of onset music training is more effective on intervention is very important. So we do in music training after we retired or just from uh, 30s or 40s, we need to start as early as possible. And the last thing is we need to uh, do some closed loop music training. And uh, uh, this is also very important. So we need to consider this in the future. And uh, at last, I would like to uh, thank my uh, group and uh, also the uh, collaborators, uh, especially Professor Yao 
in at UV visit uh, UESTC and also my students here. And also thanks Claude Alain at Baycrest under the University of Toronto in Canada and some collaborators there. And also at last, I would like to thank the grants uh, support me to doing this research. The 111 project is an NSFC and also Citroen Science and Technology Program. Thanks for your attention. This is my talk. So any questions on this? So uh, there is a question on the platform ID 6418. In the Go No Go study, in addition to a theta band, the difference between No Go and Go in beta band was also found in the average time frequency results. Can the beta band also use an aging indicator not affected by training? So in our study, we uh, only find the theta band is the most significant difference before and after training. And the beta band, we we do find some difference, but we, uh, that difference is not significant. Maybe uh, we can do another research later with a bigger uh, data sample. So question number two. So uh, question from Billy Billy. Uh, if the follow-up exploration is conducted, what abilities other than inhibitory controllability can be prioritized for study, just like I mentioned, just like the working memory, because the working memory uh, is a key factor we, we are, uh, pay attention to, uh, especially uh, in the Alzheimer's disease and also some MCI patients. The first most important symptom is they always forget things. So we will look into the working memory as the next stage. And another question is, does music training have the same effect on executive control or inhibitory control in children or adults? That is a very good suggestion. So uh, our study only conducted in uh, adults uh, so far. Uh, next stage, we will, maybe we can consider the studies on children, but uh, just like the clinical studies where we have also many limitations on the chosen studies. So maybe we can consider later, yeah. Okay, so I think that's all my talk today. And uh, so that's all the talk, all the five speakers have finished their talks. So maybe Professor Yao, so let's move to the next session and the last session of our symposium. That's a panel discussing. Uh, see, it seems that uh, Bharat Biswa, <laughs> Maybe he won't join us. <laughs> it's too, 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 maybe too early for him today. <laughs> so uh, the rest of the speakers uh, will join. So, uh, so shall we start? Maybe in this panel discussion, we can use Mandarin. It seems that like that, most of the audience were from China and uh, we can use Mandarin and uh, we can talk more. <laughs> Okay, I think we, we, we can uh, begin the uh, plenary discussion. Okay, so maybe I can share the, the slide you sent to me this afternoon about the journal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, you, you say, oh, I, interpret, I say some word for this uh, slide. Yeah, sure. You you can talk 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 with some. Okay, yeah, just uh, uh, turn to the next page. Here, I just want to uh, tell uh, uh, all the audience and the other uh, speakers what's uh, brain apparatus communication. Uh, in this uh, symposium, uh, our uh, speaker. Uh, cover the uh, this four, uh, four topic. The topic one is about the functional signal in brain. That's the uh, uh, basic of all the uh, uh, problem. The topic one is about brain organ uh, uh, interaction, uh, such as uh, uh, brain metabolism, uh, the purine signal by Professor Tang, and the brain gut, uh, the 
biological uh, searches uh, and its uh, relation with the brain cognition by Professor Yi Zhang. And the topic two about the brain mercy interaction uh, by Professor Yang Song Zhang. He uh, developed, developed this specific uh, deep learning algorithm for SSVP and the motor imagery. I think the music and the uh, uh, acupuncture may be uh, classified to the topic three. It's about the integration of uh, the BSA one and the BSA two, uh, because the uh, brain music relation actually involve both psychiatry and the uh, physiological oscillation intervention, uh, and the brain uh, acupuncture uh, involve the neural uh, action uh, and the metabolism. Uh, that, uh, that's a, a general uh, uh, content of the bring up parameter com communication. So for the panel discussion, maybe uh, uh, the audience may be interested to how can we push BSA-1 and BSA-2 and how to integrate BSA-1 and BSA-2 to BSA-3 and uh, what's the uh, general applications uh, scan scanner, scanner. Uh, that's my suggestion. The next page is uh, 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 something about the uh, journal. Uh, we, we have the uh, new journal for uh, brain apparent communication. Uh, we are very welcome all people who are interested to this uh, topic to have your paper to, to submit to this journal. It's uh, free. It's free. And we have a, a WeChat official account. Uh, you may uh, scan this uh, uh, pattern to, to join uh, this uh, uh, account. Uh, that's my 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 uh, words. So maybe uh, back to the la last page. So you uh, uh, and we also welcome the audience to uh, give a, a suggestion and a question for uh, this this problem. Lujin, you can use the Chinese language? Yes, it's panel discussion. If you can use Chinese language, you can use Chinese language. If you can see the problem from the platform, you can use Chinese language. Yes, you can use Chinese language. There are other problems from the platform. Yes, there are other problems from the platform. Yes, there are other problems. 呃，没有问到的，就是呃，有一个问唐勇老师啊 ，quick question for Professor Chang. So, what is the mechanism of non-invasive intervention in the cerebral cortex to archive weight loss? Okay. Um. Now, an um, acupuncture is useful, and the Acupuncture is useful for control uh, the weight loss. Uh, it was been clarified by the clinic trial or animal experiment. And the mechanism may be related to the hypothalamus that is very important for the region to uh, get involved with the uh, neuron, immune, and uh, late work. Yeah, that's very important. And also, we have found that maybe some cytokine generated by our muscle, by the muscle, very important. Because insert of the needle into the end point includes the muscle layer. That will be another uh, issue, yeah, another factor. OK. Oh, OK. Thank you, Professor Chang. And, uh... Another question is for Professor Yang Song Zhang. Uh, thank you for the explanation uh, for the steady state visual evoked potential SSVP. I have a question to ask what is the ITR of SSVP net and whether it can achieve a good response speed in the control? Uh, 
uh, in fact, an ITR is uh, another matrix to evaluate the uh, DCI systems. Uh, in fact, the ITR is related to the accuracy of the uh, method and also related to the number of targets and the uh, length of time windows used uh, and to conduct the recognitions. And we just uh, present the accuracy in our uh, talk. Uh, in fact, uh, um, with the certain number of targets, the higher accuracy will result in a higher um, um, information transfer rate. That's all. Okay, thank you. So uh, another question is for me. So does music training have the same effect on executive control or inhibitory control in children? So we, we never done some experiments in, on children, but I believe there should be some effect, but we, maybe we can uh, do this study later. Okay, so another question is the music training. So if we uh, end the training time and um, uh, could we uh, last the training effect? So maybe, so that's a good idea. So maybe in the next stage, we can uh, consider this research and uh, maybe we can design an experiment to do, uh, to uh, detect uh, how long would should, uh, this music training could last and uh, uh, how long the training could last longer. So yeah, that's a good question, thanks. Uh, okay, thank, I, I think that's all for, okay, so another question for Professor Yi Zhang. So what is the mechanism of non-invasive intervention? Yes, I, I think this, this, uh, this question already asked uh, Dr. Tang just now, but uh, the audience wants to ask Dr. Uh, Professor Zhang for this time. So what is the mechanism of non-invasive intervention? in the cerebral, uh, cerebral cortex to achieve weight loss. Okay. Um, just, uh, before uh, we are uh, carry out the uh, non-invasive modulation uh, study, we choose the target region for as a target region for modulation. It's based on um, a biological surgery because uh, uh, we have a knowledge of uh, one of base status, the like DRPFC, the activation is uh, uh, decreased, uh, uh, incre uh, decreased, uh, but uh, when post surgery, like uh, LSG surgery, increase the like, activation of DFFC, it means when you at the status of all base, means your uh, DLPFC activation activity is decreased. So, based on this knowledge, we are trying to target this area and uh, try to. Uh, real time neurofeedback of the signal as a visual as a visual a signal signal to index the people to modulate the, the, the activity of their the DLPFC's activation means increase the, the DLPFC activation means we you can increase the you have a control to against the, the reward motivation. That's the that's the mechanism that we are based on. And also the post-modulation um, uh, image study show the improvement of the enhanced uh, co functional connectivity between the DLPFC and ACC or between the DLPFC and the coded. Yeah, let's see. Okay, so that, I think that's all for now. That's all the questions. So maybe uh, let, uh, let's talk about the uh, question or the issue raised by Professor Yao, and maybe we can talk about something about bringing a prioritized communication and uh, uh, what's the uh, applications, what, uh, what, what, what we can do in the future about this uh, area. Uh, Dr. Lu, uh, uh, Professor Yao wants to go to uh, the previous uh, slides to show the BAC1, BAC2, and the BAC3. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this, this one. <laughs> so.
So any comment on this topic? Uh, uh, based on your uh, speciality, then. OK， 我来开个头吧。好。OK， 嗯，我我就用中文讲也可以。好，嗯，呃，我觉得就是说这个脑气交互学哈，但不管包括这个 BSC one two and three 嘛哈，就是这几个，嗯，因为我知道它的定义其实还可不可以，呃，再把它再具体一下，在这个特别是这个气。因为脑气交互学，其实一个这个气的话，就有点像，就是说，嗯，像中文这里边的讲有一个叫有形的气，或者叫无形的气，就是这个工具吧，这个 tool。其实那个，比如刚才讲到这个音乐 music， 呃 ，music， 比如说它是一个这个相当于一个感觉啊，一个刺激的方式，它它实际上是看不见的，就是、说有点类似于这个无形的气。那比如说讲的，我们讲这个有形的气，这个器具哈，比如说这个老气交互学，那可能锻炼、打麻将、打游戏等等哈，就是相当于，呃，看怎么来就是拓展这个一个叫有形无形，或者是叫一个狭义的，或者叫广义的，把这个气这个可能再把它定义一下。第二个就是这个老 brain， 老的话其实。那当然，这里边是讲 B one to three， 其实输入输出。那么，包括今天大家所报告到的，其实它可能，嗯，包括了从不同层次，也就是说，从整个的 network 网络，或者从某个某一个组织，不管我们的 MPFC， 或者说夏秋老，或者说这个海马，或者说哪下等等吧，哈，哪些老区，其实也就是说，从这个网络。从组织脑区，或者是深入到就是到底在细胞，或者哪一个，比如说神经元，或者是神经信息胶，或者是就是神经元，或者说其他的啊信息胶、小胶、扫突胶等等，这细这些细胞。当然，再往下层面讲，就是相当于这个脑啊，就可能说分子水平，也就是说这个气可以是一个广义、狭义的。那么这个脑，基于它自身的，就是说脑的话，那就是这个。老的从网络、组织，或者说细胞分子等等水平，呃，甚至还包括它的这个 communication 或者你叫 interaction。除此之外，这个脑其实大家也提到了，还应该包括这个 brain 和其他全身的其他连接。当然，现在呢，就是做的多的可能这就是 gut 啊，肠道脑肠的问题。其实现在也提出来了，这个 brain 和 lung 和肺 ，brain 和肝啊 ，liver。甚至当然，其实心、心和脑 ，brain 和 heart 也是，包括 brain 和肾啊等等哈，就是全身的，这都有关系。也就是说，在脑这方面，一个从它自身来说，是在这个从网络到组织到细胞到分子层面，然后它的相互关系。另外呢，哦，当然这里边分子层面当然就包括很多 pathway 啊，或者说 target 等等。除此之外，就是我讲和其老外的这些。不管是我们的组织器官，还包括刚才我提到的，比如说讲这个 muscle 肌肉，也就是说，包括现在不管运动啊、跑步等等，运动的时候，肌肉它要分泌很多肌肉因子，其实这个已经证实，肌肉因子啊，包括那个 e r o s i o n 等等，能够进入我们脑袋，其实它是有关系的。那就说，也许我们其他什么什么的这个气，能够刺激它，能够对我们进行调整啊，这是。在这个第二个就是这个脑这方面，第三个我建议呢，就是说因为这个是一个交叉学科，其实交叉学科，我我建议刚刚突然想到了，就是现在那个国家自然基金委的那个交叉学科部正在征求那个重大项目的建议书，我觉得呢，有机会的时候，我们可以以这个哈、啊，就是去想办法，嗯、呃，提点这个这个叫什么 proposal 等等哈、啊。希望能够推动我们的这个研究的继续。第四一个方面，一个小建议就是说，嗯，因为有这个杂志了，有这个杂志呢，我觉得可能就是说，在筹划策划怎么样
有个别的一些 special issue 啊专题，那么特别是能够扩大影响力的啊，就是扩大我们杂志的影响力的专题，那么这样去推动。嗯，最后呢，就是说还可以，如果在没有国家的这个重大的这个项目也好，计划也好等等，我知道姚姚姚院长那儿有很多的资源，就是、说也可以通过其他的什么途径。做一个把这个领域啊，我选选好某一个点，能够呢有一个突破，可能这个就是扩大这个领域的影响力。嗯 ，OK， 我说的不一定正确哈，仅供参考。非常好，非常好，谢谢。嗯，好，谢谢谢唐老师，杨老师这儿插播一个问题吧，就是那个有一个观众提问，就是请问脑气交互对传统的 BCI 有什么指导作用？这个呃，谁谁的回答？那张亚松来回答，张老师来回答。哎，好的，杨老师。嗯，其实，呃，也也我也有幸参与了这这个杨老师的这个这个，这个、就是当时当年那篇论文的一个相关工作。嗯，其实呃，怎么来说呢？我们嗯，在这个呃神经工程领域，其实有很多的一些相关的概念，比如脑机接口、脑和机械的交互、脑脑交互等等等等。嗯，有很多很多相关的概念。其实这些概念来讲的话，它其实它都是，呃，针对某一个具体的，比如说，嗯，这个单纯的，比如说工程技术来来讲，呃，我们，我们现在就是姚老师提出了这个脑机交互的以及脑机交互学的这样一一个概念，它应该是从顶层的这样一个设计，呃呃，来，来来来讲的，它应该是说，呃，我们的脑机交互，也就是姚老师这边这个 slide 里面。呃 ，Topic Two 里面的，其实传统的脑机接口应该就归到这个，呃，嗯 ，BAC 呃 Two 这个这这一栏里头去，嗯、呃，还有一些很多的其他的，比如说，呃，刚才唐老师讲的，比如说我们，呃，大脑或我们肠道的交互和心脏的交互等等这些，其实，在传统的这个 BCI 的里面，它的定义里面，其实它就没有很好的去涵盖一些，呃，这些概念。同时呢，我们现在其实，嗯、呃，在这个脑机交互学里面。它应该是分了三类的，第一个就是我们的这个大脑与这个呃生命器官的这样一个交互，第二个呢应该就是我们脑与外界非生命器官以及环境的这样一个一个交互，第三个呢是我们讲的第一类和第二类之间的的一个有机的整合这样一个一个一个概念。所以说我们呃姚老师提的这个呃脑机交互的这样一个概念来讲的话，它应该是一个嗯这。呃呃，一般的这样一个呃嗯、呃、概念性的东西，它作为一可以作为一个新的理念和和思想，对吧？它讲我们的这个研究的一个主体，我们的这个方法论以及研究领域，很好的有机的融合在一起，是是这样一个概念。嗯，这是我这个嗯呃一个一个简单的这样一个理解吧。其其实刚才唐老师讲的很多的这些一些概念，呃，其实在。这个在这个姚老师提的这个脑机交互学里面，它其实都涵盖下去了，只是呃，在可能在这个 slice 里面，可能有一些呃呃定义啊，或者是这个呃内容啊没有体现出来，所所以说呃，唐老师可以去看一下姚老师在这个呃两千年的那篇这个很长的这篇综述，呃，包括姚老师最近可能会有一篇新的这个呃一个比较呃更嗯、呃、这个嗯。呃更更高高端的这样一个概念吧，就在这个呃 b a k e n e w s 这个这个期刊上会会发出来，呃，到时候我们呃可可以可以嗯嗯嗯期待一下。好，谢谢大家。那那个要不我补充一下，我我觉得那个杨生讲的哈，这个脑机接口呢，它脑机脑机交互实际上是对脑机接口的一个极大的拓展，就它范围就是有一个扩大了的。另外一个哈，就是我们刚才其实。几位专家在讲的时候，也有人在问这个问题了，就是你这个干预的效应能够持续多久呢？能够持续多久呢？我的理解，其实它呃有些呃时候持续不久的原因哈，就类似于管理学当中的那个水桶呃那个那个那个那个就水桶的那个呃模板效应那个短板效应那个那个情况呢，就你通过训练把某一方面的那个能力提上去了的，但是如果说你整个这个系统不支持这样一个。单项能力的提升，那么它随着时间的呃推移，它就会退回去的，它还是会回到原来的状况
所以老师在后面概念就是强调这个呃 top three 的，就是强调这个整合的。就你脑子这口呃，在提升那个跟外在交互能力的同时呢，那么我们脑与我们自己内内在器官的这样一个交互也要相应的适应上去了。那么这个时候啊，你你获得的这种技能，它才能可能持久的，是吧？才可能持久的。就像那个刚才那个张老师讲的那个，比如说减肥这件事儿，是吧？如果你只是说那个呃呃不让他吃饭的，他可能也能够减肥，但是他没有从根上解决问题了，就他的那个他那种愿望还在的。那么隔一段时间之后，他可能又会反弹的。我这个例子不一定很恰当哈，大概是这个意思的。嗯呃，那姚老师，那个各位老师，我谈谈我的想法。因为昨天那个卢老师让我思考思考，我也说，我想想啊，因为其实我也感挺感谢姚老师提出来这个领域的，就 brain apparatus 这个领域，因为我们以前投稿的时候也很难，因为我这个东西是不是是 neuroscience 的？哎，投过去人家说你这是肠子的，不是关特别关注脑子的。然后投到像 g a s t r o 一类的杂志，人家说你这又不是关注脑子的，弄得我们两边都不是。所以刚开始前些年投稿的时候是那样子的问题啊，所以我们就转变我们自己的写法和这个研究的着重点，可能更靠近于像 neuroscience 这边来，从脑影像的角度来介入了。但是正好姚老师提出来这样一个脑机交互的概念，包括创办的期刊，我我我我非常支持啊，也给我们这些做这这种交脑机交互的这个研究人员提供了一个平台交流。然后刚才那个唐老师也提到了，其实。呃，在脑机交互，这是一个很、很、很、很大的一个概念，没有做任何的束缚。但是就我们日常了解到的，比如说我们有肠脑交互、心脑交互、肾脑轴，甚至肝心脑病的这种研究都很都有都有报道了。那我自己理解就是说，这个东西在报道的某一个方面，可能关注的是一个脏器和大脑之间的这样一个异常的交互，但实际上呢，在整个的这样一个交互的过程中。它不光是我们提到的这个肠子和脑，其实很多的系统都参与进去了。所以呢，我觉得在我们日后的研究当中，可能更多的要去从更一个更宏观的角度，或者是更广泛的角度考虑整个过程中的一个变化。那好了，我们关注脑子，但是我们现在用 EEG 或者说用这个磁共振影像来捕捉到这个大脑的变化，它可能是一些作用的结果，或者是表象。那这个表象背后的机制是什么？所以我们可能也要在研究的深入的话，可能像唐老师追求的这个嘌呤啊，这些因子，血液里面因子啊，包括我刚才也提到的这些啊、呃，肠道肠道的菌群，呃，这个荷尔蒙代谢物、短链脂肪酸这些东西，它是如何来通过外周血液循环来作用我们大脑，然后去影响我们大脑功能的？我觉得可能把这些联系在一起，可能使得我们的研究更深入。揭示更能揭示其中的这样一个机制，呃，这是我想说的第一点啊，就是要关注这些生理过程如何来影响大脑的。第二点就是说，因为我们现在针对的是呃做的研究都是人体的，但是呢，人体的就有局限了，我们不可能去做更多的解剖，做分子水平或者是血液因子方面的研究，所以中间的这个因果关系是如何来体现的，可能对于我们来说就是一个挑战。我们不光是做人的研研究纳入进来，我们可能将来做动物模型的研究的这些学者也纳入到这个领域来，然后我们更好的结合，将人体的研究和动物的研究结合在一起，可能更能揭示我们背后的这些机制，更有助于我们回答一些我们回答不了的问题。呃，第三个就是，呃，既然不单纯是脑的问题的话，那就牵扯到身体里面更多的生理的过程。这个数据维度来说，对于我们就是一个。海量的数据了，尤其是我们现在做肠道菌群，还要做内分泌、做代谢，包括做脑影像的时候，不同的尺度、不同的维度的数据分析，就有很大的挑战。所以像刚才张张洋松老师里面，他虽然做的是一季的这个深度学习，我也在想，我们的方法部分也能把它纳入到我们这种多维度、多尺度的数据上来应用，可能更有助于我们揭示我们，呃，找到里边的特征，找到不同的。这种系统之间作用的这种关系，这是我我的第二点思考。第三点呢，就是说，呃，因为脑气交互是一个双向的，因为我们我做的这个肠脑减重手术，它是干预肠子来看，我们其实逆向过来来看它对大脑的影响
。那我们后面做的一个工作，我们是调控大脑，我看对我们的减重有没有这个影响。所以我就在想，这个研究的话是两头，所以我们现在可能从一头入手去看大脑的变化，那我们从另外一头入手，能不能看一下它下游的跟气脏器的变化，能不能起到类似的像外科手术呀、啊、像药物的作用？那如果说这个东西有类似的效果的话，那我将来就可以开展这种。无创的这种脑调控或者脑刺激的方式，来起到这种干预的效果。呃，这是我想说的，呃，第第第三点啊，呃，第四点的话就是杨老师，我因为就是最近他们那个我们也收到了，就是那个清华大学一个院士叫唐家唐家唐唐唐院士吧，他办了一个期刊叫《Intelligent Medicine》，然后呢，我也想就是对我们这期刊做点贡献，就是说。他刚开始邀邀请了很多的这种综述文章，其实综述文章呢，可能引用率会高一些，对期刊的影响力会提高。所以我在想，如果姚老师将来计划这个我们这个杂志，如果可以办一些专刊，我也可以愿意负责，比如像长脑互动这些东西，去去邀请一些像综述文章啊，或者我自己已经定稿了，九月三十号有一篇文章和投稿，想提高这个杂志的这样一个学术影响力。啊，这是我想说的这么几点，谢谢各位老师。啊、嗯，很好，我觉得呃，前面几位老师都都讲的呃，非常有有有那个启发性的。有没有问？有没有那个呃，平台上有没有问题？呃，杨老师，平台上现在没有了。没有，那那你们俩，你们两个还要不要再讲一下那个卢金和那个杨松？呃，要不我就简单说两句吧。那个也是非常感谢杨老师那个邀请，在这个论坛里做报告。就是脑气交互这个概念呢，就是呃，我觉得就是非常的前沿啊。我我我的感觉是，这个杨老师站在那个哲学的高度上提出了一个科学概念。就比如拿我这个做的这个音乐干预的这个例子啊，就是。呃，其实我们那个以前更多关注的，比如脑子怎么产生音乐，然后包括我刚才报告里讲的，就是音乐怎么去影响我们的大脑。但是呢，就是里面感觉还差了一些环节，比如两个的一个相互作用，包括那个其实呃这个方面还更多的要向那个呃张毅、谭勇老师那个学习，就是比如说我们这些外界的刺激怎么影响我们内部脏器啊，就是包括这个音乐也是，也许可能是不是这个。呃，音乐的一些节奏啊，也会给我们的一些脏器产生一些，就比如说类似于共振啊，一些呃这种呃物理上的一些这种刺激变化。其实就是把这几个通路要呃这个研究完全彻底过后，才能形成一个闭环啊。所以我那个报告最后那个 take home message 也提到，就是一个 close loop 的一个 interaction， 也许可能呃是这个，就是至少在我我我做这个音乐研究、干预研究的这个领域里面一个非常重要的一个。方面吧，也希望就是这个领域呢，就是呃，能更加这个丰富这个脑气交互的这么一个这个作用和这个丰富它的这个内涵，呃，也做自己的一些贡献吧。啊，我就大概说这么几几几句，杨生。好的，好的。杨松有没有什么那个要补充的？嗯，就是针对杨叔说的第一个问题吧，就是怎么来推进这个。你说这个脑气交互的时候，因为我其实，嗯，跟姚老师读博士到到现在，其实做的做的最多的就是这个呃脑信号的解码算法的一一一些一一些研究或者应用吧。其实现在呃怎么来说呢？我们在在这个算法这算法这块，不管是这个嗯、呃、对大脑大脑信号的解码，或者是这个我们这个反向的来研究这个脑机制这些来讲的话，其实现在的很多算法其实也遇到了一些瓶颈。尤其是我们现在有很多的算法，包括其实刚才我在讲，我们这个报告的时候有有一个嗯提问，就是说我们现在对于这个深度学习模型来讲的话，我们怎么来避免这个模型的过拟合？其实因为现在我们很多时候，尤其是对于这个，比如说这个呃疾病状态下的这些人群的这个数据采集，其实是一个哦非常困难的，就是我们很多时候去做这种。嗯，大脑的信号解码，因为它其实我们这个，呃，脑脑气交互学的话，它是一个双向的，就是说我们既要对大脑信号进行解码，也要呃反向的，就是对这些信号进行编码，呃，对大脑进行这样一个调控。这些其实这个里面的算法的话
对数据的这个依赖还是程度还是蛮大的。就是、说，嗯、呃，在这块可能今后我们可能需要去，呃，去，呃，怎么去设计一些，比如说新的这种智能信息模型。嗯、呃，虽然我我讲了几个，比如说对于稳态视觉发电位啊，或者是移动想象，我们是基于这个它本身的这个神经机制这个角度来做的。嗯、呃，但实际上。我们这个模型呢，其实也，呃，带有一些，比如说，呃，传统的这种，比如说来自一种计算机视觉的这些，呃，就是呃，挪用的这个概念在里头，其实还没有完全基于这个，比如说我们脑机交互的这样一个，它底层的这些，呃，比较深入的这个神经机制来来来做这样的算法设计。所以说呢，我们这个呃脑机交互的这样一个概念，也应该说是为我们今后做这个、呃、算法设计提供了一个很好的这样一个。呃呃呃，理论框架和这个一个一个指一个指导吧。啊，另外一个呢，就是其实呃，这些年呢，我呃也做在尝试去做一些这个脑疾病的这样一些呃一一些解码。其实最后一个比较简单的工作，是我们近一年做的一个比较粗略的工作。其实我们现在对这个脑疾病的这个其实研究的话，可能更多的还是只是就是说，呃，我看一下这个脑子怎么样的。其实刚才有呃张毅老师还有这个呃唐老师，其实也讲讲了。讲讲了很多了，其实我们可能对这些脑疾病，比如说我们这个呃，这个脑性痴呆，或者是这个呃，注意缺失的等等这一类的，或者精分等等这一类疾病的话，可能我们是不是很应该要把这个思维放宽，呃，利用这个脑机交互的这个概念，就是我们不仅仅是关注我们大脑本身的这样一个它的异常，我们可能要去呃看一些它这个关联的，比如说我们这个呃，我我我们的这个嗯。呃我们的心，我们的这个肠道，我们的这个呃一些外周的其他的器官的这样一个，它在这个呃这个疾病的这个变化过程中，它所产生的这样一些一些影响，也许我们可以就说反向的，比如从我们与大脑交互的这些呃器官入手，进行这样一个双向的这样一个呃调控，也许我可能会达到一些呃更好的效果。呃，总之呢，就是说我们这个呃确实这个。脑机交互这样一个概念，它给我们这个研究的主体以及我们这个呃呃方法论和我们这个应用场景提供了一个很好的这样一个呃统一的框架，也为我们呃今后去做一些这些研究的话，呃呃给出了很好的这样一个一一个行动指南吧。呃，我我就讲这些，谢谢姚老师。行，如果说呃没有其他的那个，我们这个时间也到了呗。我真的是发自内心的哈，非常感谢几位那个呃抽出宝贵时间来来来参与这个新破人的，而且每个人的工作都做得非常好，非常有特色的，那个呃也也做得很系统的。呃，我我倒觉得刚才大家也说了很多很好的建议的，我们这个以后呃继续加强联系，找机会来合作，然后我们看。能不能一起哈把这个领域往前推一下呢？也也希望它能够真正在某些方面发挥一些作用，能够如果说对对那个呃，如果对老百姓的这个健康或者对国家的一些那个前面的技术，如果说任何一个方面如果能够真正发挥作用，我觉得我们这个呃就就就就就就算是一做了一点有意义的工作嘛，就是我觉得这个是呃非常欣慰的一件事情呢。呃，我我我我们这个，其他我就不说了，反正就是呃，就就是一句话，非常感谢的。我们也非常感谢我们这个在那个网上的那个呃听众哈，我刚才看了一下，有好像有三千多呃听听众的，在那些 symposium 当中还算是比较多的的。我觉得这个也也说明大家对这个领域还是呃有有比较大的兴趣的，比较大的兴趣的。这个老七交付啊，这个我觉得它也也有一点那个巧合的层面在里面。就这个那个器哈，就中文的这个器，它有器件和器官的意思的，就好像有一点那个呃，冥冥当中的一种统一性的。然后那个英文单词啊，那个 apparatus 这个单词哈，在英文当中它也有这两个意思的，也可以包含器件，也可以包含器官。好像就是说这两个东西呃，是不是本来就应该是放到一起来考虑哈？不管是从呃中国人来讲还是外国人来讲的，那是不是这个上帝就是这么安排的？就是应该把他们。放到一起来考虑，呃，通盘考虑，整合来考虑的。所以说，我们，呃，我我们本着这样一个思想，我们来来努力来呃推一把这件事情呢。呃，我我就不不说不说更多了的啊，谢谢谢大家，谢谢大家。嗯，谢谢姚老师，谢谢各位老师啊。啊，谢谢谢谢谢谢。嗯，好的，周末愉快，周末愉快，愉快。
。好，谢谢杨老师，谢谢各位老师啊，再见。嗯，罗老师再见，张老师再见，唐老师，罗老师再见。